We welcome all of you to our worship service this morning, and we also welcome those who are listening to us on the radio or following along on the internet. As part of a church, we're part of a team, a team that serves Christ. In our worship service this morning, we'll realize the importance of that and what it means uh, for us as Christians. We begin our service today with our first hymn, 532. Please stand. Our order of service this morning is the uh, common service written on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. Uh, please note that in place of the glory be to God on page 16, 
We'll be singing hymn 250. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. with you. Let us pray. Merciful, gr mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts, for without your help we are unable to please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The first lesson is written in Numbers chapter 11, beginning at verse 4. The foreign rabble who were among the Israelites were overcome by their craving. 
The Israelites also wept once again and said, Who is going to give us meat to eat? We remember the fish we ate in Egypt free of charge, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our lives are wasting away. We have nothing at all to look at except this manna. Moses heard the people from all the clans weeping, each one at the entrance to his own tent. At the same time, the Lord's anger burned fiercely, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your eyes? Why did you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people by myself? Am I the one who gave birth to them so that you tell me to carry them in my arms to the land which you swore to their fathers, just as a woman who is, nur who is nursing carries a baby? Where is there meat for me to give to all these people? Listen, they are weeping to me and saying, Give us meat so that we can eat. I am not able to carry all these people by myself because that is too much for me. If you're going to treat me in this way, please kill me right now. If I have found favor in your eyes, do not let me see my own ruin. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather seventy men from the elders of Israel for me, men whom you know to be elders and officers for the people. Take them to the tent of meeting and make them stand there with you. Moses went out and told the people the Lord's words. He gathered seventy men from the elders of the people and had them stand all around the tent. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him. He took from the spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do it again. Two men, however, remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tent. The spirit rested on them, and they prophesied back in the camp. A young man ran and reported this to Moses. He said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aide from his youth, answered, My Lord Moses, stop them. Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? If only all of the Lord's people were prophets so that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses returned to the camp along with the elders of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 133 and Psalm 134.
second lesson is written in the book of James, chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. So submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded people. Lament, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be changed into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother is speaking against the law and judging the law. But if you judge the law, you are not the one who does the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge. He is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Please stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 38. This will also serve as our sermon text for this morning. John said to him, that is to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name. They tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not try to stop him because no one who does a miracle in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil about me. Whoever is not against us is for us. Amen, I tell you. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall into sin, it would be better for him if he were thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around his neck. If your hand causes you to fall into sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to fall into sin, Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to fall into sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will it, you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. now join in confessing our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated for our next hymn, hymn 535, hymn 535. The Apostle Paul wrote about the church to the Ephesians when he said, You are no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Our text for this morning is the gospel that was read earlier, Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 50. Your fellow members of God's household. It has begun. The season of sports. This time of year, it seems as though sports 
takes center stage in so much of our thinking because so many sports are going on. Here in Nebraska, we get absorbed with the uh, women's volleyball team at the University of Nebraska, with the Cornhuskers football team. Our eyes are glued to the TV set to see how they're doing, or we scan the sports pages. But that's not all. Major League Baseball playoffs begin this week. The National Football League is entering their fourth week. You may not realize it, but the National Hockey League's training camp has begun and they've already played a number of exhibition games. The NBA uh, training camps have begun and the WNBA playoffs are going. It's the season of team sports. When we think of team sports, we think what makes for a successful team? We think you got to have the talent. you got to have talented athletes on your team, and that's true. But quite often, the team with the most talent is not the most successful. Quite often, and maybe more often than not, it's the team that has the players who play together as a team, who are team players. We're on a team. We're on Christ's team. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts and caused us to see how lost we would be because of our sins. And then he has given us faith. As Christians, he has led us to see and to trust that he is the one who takes all of our sins away. We follow him. As Christians who follow Jesus, we learn from these verses that we follow him as team players. We accept our teammates and we practice team discipline. The event that kind of led to the words in our text this morning was an interesting one. John reported, John, one of Jesus' disciples, reported to Jesus that he and some other disciples, one of them was his brother James, had seen a man who was casting out devils in Jesus' name. This seems to have been a good thing. He was freeing people from their physical possession by demons, which was almost like an epidemic at the time of Jesus, and granting them relief. But this bothered John. It bothered John so much that he went to Jesus. First of all, he tried to stop the guy from doing it. And then he went to Jesus and complained, this man is casting out devils in your name. This does not cast a very good light on John because John is trying to prevent something good from happening, it seems like. Jesus focused on something else. He said... If this man is doing it in my name, then he's one of us. You see, when the Bible talks about doing something in the name of Jesus, especially doing a miracle, it doesn't mean like it's some sort of a magic phrase like open sesame and the door comes open. In Jesus' name meant on the basis of what Jesus had revealed about himself, on the basis of the words that Jesus had spoke and the actions that he had taken. Jesus was telling John, he couldn't do this if I didn't give him the power to do it. He was doing it in my name. And so he's telling John, you need to accept him as one of the team. Jesus went on further. To do something in my name means to be a follower of me. So if somebody were to do something just as simple as to give you a glass of water in my name because you belong to me, that person is to be accepted as a teammate. This afternoon, I'm planning to watch a football game. I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan, and the Minnesota Vikings are playing their arch rival, the Green Bay Packers. On the Minnesota Vikings is a man named Aaron Jones. 
For seven years, he was a running back for the Green Bay Packers, and then this last offseason, he signed as a free agent with the Minnesota Vikings. When he was on the Packers, I didn't really like him because he did well against the Vikings and caused them to lose games that I didn't want them to lose. But what am I to do now? Here's this man that I was opposed to, but he's wearing a Viking jersey. Well, as someone once said, cheer for the team, not the player. If he's on your team, then you accept him. Who's on our team? To whom do we belong? We're followers of Jesus, but who's with us? Who are our teammates? There's a couple of answers. One answer is every Christian in the world, every person who trusts in Jesus as their Savior is our teammate doesn't matter who they are, their age, their ethnicity, their nationality, their gender. It doesn't matter whether they belong to a church that, or don't belong to any church. If they have faith in Jesus as our Savior, we are one with them. They're our teammates. The big problem with this is we don't know who they are. The Bible tells us, and Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Being part of this one holy Christian church that we confessed in the Apostles' Creed earlier is a matter of faith. And the Bible actually warns us against trying to look into the heart. It tells us that's not your job. The Lord knows those who are his. And so even though we can't recognize faith, Faith, we don't have a measuring stick for faith. We trust that there are Christians who belong to us. Who's on our team? Whom we may, may we publicly recognize as being our teammates, like Jesus encouraged John to do with this man who is casting out devils in his name? Are we to recognize as teammates everyone who calls himself or herself a Christian? Everyone who calls himself or herself a Lutheran? Well, the answer is in Jesus' words to John. Anyone who openly recognizes the name of Jesus, his revelation, what he has shown about himself, especially in his word, we can also recognize as our teammates. To be in the name of Jesus means to accept what the Bible teaches and to reject what the Bible rejects. And so we are one with those whose confession of faith mirrors what the Bible teaches. What a blessed thing this is. We are joined to hundreds of thousands of people in our Wisconsin Synod and in the uh, synods that we're in fellowship with. We are joined to hundreds of thousands of people throughout the world on every continent and maybe even a few uh, Wells members perhaps on the continent of Antarctica. We have churches that we're associated with in North America, South America, Africa, Europe, Asia, and Australia. We practice our team uh, being team players with them, by supporting the work of our synod, by bringing our prayers to God for the success of its mission work. But we've also got teammates in a more localized sense. We're joined with a number of other congregations in supporting our Nebraska Evangelical Lutheran High School in Waco. We are joining with congregations in our area in about a month. On October 30th, there's going to be a joint Reformation service. It'll be held here at St. Paul's, but it's not St. Paul's Reformation service. It's a Reformation service for our local Wells congregations. It's an opportunity for us to accept as teammates 
those members of other congregations who come and worship here with us on that date. In a very real sense, we're teammates with the other members of our congregations, our congregation here. We support our work here. And one of the most important things for accepting teammates is the support we show them at our worship services. Someone once said that 90% of life is showing up. COVID has hit our worship attendance pretty hard. There were people who used to attend who now don't attend at all. There were people who attended once or twice a month that now come three or four times a year. There were people who attended nearly every Sunday who now come once or twice a month. The Bible teaches us that gathering together for worship is part of being a team player, part of showing our acceptance of each other and showing our support for each other. In the book of Hebrews, we're told do not give up meeting together, or some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, especially when you see that the day is approaching. We serve as team players as we follow Jesus. We accept our teammates. We also practice team discipline. The church I served in Michigan wasn't really a rural church, but it was sort of in a rural area. We were kind of on the edge of town, but we had about six acres of land, and there was a bit of open country around the, our church, and uh, one of the problems we had with that was mice getting into the church. So every once in a while, I'd come into our church building and I'd see a mouse scurry across the floor of the fellowship hall or find mouse, mice droppings and then it became well, sort of my duty, I took it on myself, to set out some traps. And then after a while I'd hear click, click, click and I'd know that maybe we had taken care of the vermin for a little while. That's part of that mouse trap that Jesus focuses on here in these verses when he says, if you cause someone to sin, or if your hand or your eye or your foot causes you to sin, that word cause to sin is a reference to uh, the thing that springs a trap. So at the time of Jesus, they were more rudimentary traps, maybe a rock on a stick with uh, some bait tied to a string that's tied to the stick, so the animal would come, grab the bait, pull the stick and boom, that would be the end of the animal. It's that stick, that trigger, that cause that Jesus uses here when he says cause to sin. What's the trigger that sets something off that is going to wind up in death and destruction? He warns John and the rest of his disciples against two things. First, against being this cause to sin, being this trigger for others. He said, if anyone causes one of these little ones of mine to sin, the little ones here could be children, they could be new to the faith, and Jesus is saying, don't do anything that's going to lead them into sin. And then he focused on his followers themselves. He said, your hand, your foot, your eye, very important parts of your body. But if they're the trigger, if they're the thing that is going to be used to lead you into sin, you're better off without them. He wasn't saying that the hand or the foot or the eye in and of itself was the cause of sin. What he was saying is they're instruments. If your sinful nature uses them as instruments to sin, then you're in trouble. And the trouble was very dire. Jesus very graphic here. He talks about leading others into sin, and he said, if you cause one of these little ones of mine who believe in me to sin, it would be better to have a large millstone tied around your neck and to be thrown into the depths of the sea. These millstones were huge and heavy. 
hundreds and hundreds of pounds they weighed. Tied, get tied to that and get thrown into the depths of the sea, you don't have a chance. Very graphic reminder of the danger of leading others into sin. And then, again, quite graphic, your hand or your foot or your eye leads you into sin, cut them off. Because if you don't, if they lead you into sin, what do you have to look forward to? An unquenchable fire, total destruction in hell. Then Jesus changes the picture a little bit. When he talks about practicing team discipline, not only do you practice team discipline in not causing others to sin or falling into sin yourself, but in terms of salt. This is a little bit difficult for us. When we think of salt, it's usually one of two things, isn't it? It's what we put on our food or what we put on our roads. At the time of Jesus, salt was used as a preservative. But if it didn't have the potency, it wasn't going to preserve very much if the potency was lost. The salt here, that this preservative, was Jesus' word, was his promises. What he was telling them, you've got to practice team discipline. If you lose the word of God, if you wander away from it, doesn't have any power anymore to preserve your faith. And you can be lost. These words are kind of chilling words to us. If we really search our hearts and lives, we know just how much they apply to us. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, try being a parent without setting a bad example ever for your children, without ever treating your children in a way that maybe gave them the opportunity to sin. Even if you're not a parent, have we ever led anyone else by what we've said or done to follow the wrong path? And we know what our hands have done. We know where our feet have walked. We know what our eyes have seen. We're guilty. Does that mean there's a millstone with our name on it? Has Satan reserved a room for us in hell where there's an unquenchable fire? Thanks be to God, that's not the case. There was a millstone with our name on it, but it got hung around the neck of Jesus. Jesus didn't lose a hand or a foot or an eye. He lost everything. He lost his entire life. He lost the uh, blessings of God as he died on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because all that happened. There's no millstone in our future. There's no unquenchable fire in our future. Instead, it was all put on him. And so now, now we're going to practice team discipline. Every once in a while you read a story about some guy on some team who does something that just messes up that team's chance for victory. Maybe somebody gets drunk the night before. Maybe somebody gets angry and punches the water cooler and can't pitch after that. Maybe somebody takes a foolish penalty in a game and costs his team the victory. They don't practice team discipline. That's not going to be us. We're going to practice team discipline. We're going to commit our lives not to leading others into sin, not to letting our hands or our feet or our eyes do whatever our sinful nature wants them to do. But it's not just what we're going to avoid. 
It's what we're going to focus on. That's salt. That salt that preserves our faith. We're going to focus on the Word of God, especially the promises of Jesus. We're going to look for opportunities that God gives us, not only in our worship services, but also in our Bible classes. We've got a number of them going on in our church. Sunday morning, Monday night, Wednesday morning, Thursday night. We have many chances to study God's Word and to let that salt preserve our faith. And what blessed thing happens then? Not a millstone, not an unquenchable fire, but the promise of life now by faith and life forever in heaven. The poet John Donne wrote, No man is an island separate unto himself. With those words, he was encouraging people to believe we're not alone. We're all connected to each other. Some have kind of taken off on his words and spoken of our human race as the brotherhood of man. We're all joined together. And there is a certain truth to that. But the truth to that is a sad truth. If that's our fellowship, our joining together, it's a fellowship and a team of sin and guilt and condemnation. Thanks be to God, he's made us part of another team. He's made us followers of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we serve as team players. We accept our teammates, and we practice team discipline. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Please be seated as we gather our offering. Uh, during the offering, we will sing hymn 538, The Church's One Foundation.
We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Please stand for prayer. O Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give those teachers and students to pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. It's pleased Almighty God to call out of this veil of tears to himself in heaven the soul of Michaela McGinty. She is the mother of uh, uh, Dustin Kramer's two sons, Bailey and Riley. She passed away late last week. We pray. O Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer Michaela, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your son Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with the sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest, and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. closing hymn 330, hymn 330, and the Sunday school children. 